This episode of the Practice of Therapy podcast is brought to you by Therapy Notes. You can find out more about them by going to practiceoftherapy.com slash therapy notes. Hello, I'm Corden Brewer, and welcome to the Practice of Therapy podcast where we explore the business and clinical sides of running a private practice. Well, hello, everyone. I'm Gordon Brewer, and welcome to the Practice of Therapy podcast. And this is episode number 247 of the podcast. I'm looking forward to you hearing from my guest today, Jenny Hughes, and this is a topic that we kind of jump into today that I don't know that I've covered here on the podcast before, and it really kind of gets more into the kind of the clinical side of things, but just really um, this whole concept of vicarious trauma, and I think that that has been um, a phenomenon that we've become more and more aware of, particularly through the you know, through these last several years of dealing with COVID and just how it's affecting us. And we see it certainly uh, in people that work specifically in trauma. I think about emergency room uh, caregivers and uh, docs and nurses and, um, you know, those kinds of folks, I'm sure, experience some of this. But Anyway, we're going to jump into this topic, and it just really uh, echoes the importance of self-care and being able to have community around your practice, uh, particularly with the stuff that we do. Um, you know, one, one of the things that I know is that um, we do some very tough work with people, and we hear lots of very tough stories that can affect us emotionally. And um, you're going to hear this reflected in my interview with Jenny, just, um, you know, how we handle things ourselves when we're working with people that um, are just are tough cases or tough situations that are affecting us. So anyway, lo- looking forward to us getting to that uh, here in just a moment. Before we do that, though, one of the things I'd love for you to do is go, particularly if you are in the starting phases of being in private practice, I'd love for you to find out more about the Practice Launch Club. The Practice Launch Club is a new membership community that I started this year to really help those folks that are in the beginning stages of starting their practice. Uh, It's a community, and we meet once a month for a focus group where we interact with each other on Zoom. And then also we have an exclusive membership community on the Circle app or a Circle platform where we can ask each other questions and interact with each other. Also part of the Practice Launch Club is you get tutorials and uh, different lessons on different aspects of starting a private practice. For example, learning what you need to do about business entities and accounting and uh, taxes and all of those things that go into starting a private practice. So I'd love for you to come over and check it out. And you can do that by going to practiceoftherapy.com slash launch club and find out more about that and how you can join in the fun and the community. And also, before we get to my interview with Jenny, love for you to hear from our sponsor, Therapy Notes. As your practice grows, the systems and processes you have in place will keep your practice running smoothly. That is why it is important to have an electronic health record system that is specific to mental health providers. Therapy Notes is a complete practice management system with everything you need to manage patient records, schedule appointments, meet with patients remotely, create rich documentation, and bill insurance right at your fingertips. Their streamlined software is accessible wherever and whenever you need it. They are who Gordon uses in his practice. And did I mention that they are one of the top-rated EHRs for mental health private practices? Their support is also second to none. Be sure to check them out at practiceoftherapy.com slash therapy notes. Be sure to use the promo code Gordon to get two months free. Well, 
hello everyone and welcome again to the podcast and I'm so happy for you to get to know Jenny Hughes. Jenny, welcome. Thank you. I'm so glad to be here. Yes, and uh, this this is a topic that I don't know that we've uh, we've we've quite we've done. We might have hit on it somewhere along the way, but I I love just delving into topics as we were chatting about before we started recording around self care and the big one being that that your kind of your expertise is in vicarious trauma. But before we get to that, if you don't mind, tell folks a little bit more about yourself and how you've landed where you've landed. Yeah, so uh, my professional journey has always been in the area of trauma, but I was initially trained as a child psychologist and worked with children and families affected by child abuse and neglect, actually all the way down to babies, um, you know, working, uh, trained in child parent psychotherapy. And I loved that work. And then Um, my career took me in a different direction that I wasn't Mm -hmm. anticipating. And I ended up becoming a trauma psychologist at a level one trauma center. And so that was when I really started working with adults um, and found that I really loved that too. And then when I went to start my private practice, I really wanted to make it an online practice even Mm -hmm. before COVID. And with that, just kind of with like legal stuff and, and, and all of the things I decided to focus on adults, just getting started in private practice. So that has been my primary focus for the past few years is working with adults using telehealth Mm -hmm. and doing EMDR, cognitive processing therapy, prolonged exposure. Um, But I didn't anticipate being where I am because wherever we land right now, we can't ever predict that. And yet I'm Mm -hmm. so grateful and thankful for it. Wow. Wow. Yeah. It's uh yeah, and it's it's um I think sometimes our niche kind of kind of finds us uh, at times, and then we start doing the work, and then realize, oh wow, this is this is fascinating. This is or, or this is something that I really enjoy doing, kind of thing. So, yeah, yeah. So that's I think your story is not too untypical in that sense, but uh, yeah. So tell folks a little bit about how you got interested. In this whole concept of vicarious trauma, and maybe for folks that aren't familiar with that term to kind of describe that. Yeah, so let me define it first. Mm -hmm. So vicarious trauma, there's a lot of terms that are thrown out there about kind of some of the things that happen to helpers and healers in their profession, vicarious Mm -hmm. trauma being one of them. The way that I define it is it's that stress and trauma that we soak up by being empathic humans who want to help and heal others. Mm -hmm. Um, Other kind of synonyms that are used are like secondary traumatic stress, compassion fatigue, burnout. I actually see those as all separate constructs, Mm -hmm. all kind of on a similar spectrum. Um, But I focus in on vicarious trauma because I see it as kind of the port of entry to the 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 therapist burnout process, really, Mm -hmm. where Mm -hmm. if vicarious trauma is inevitable, if you are an empathic human and you're working with other people, you're going to soak up their stress and trauma, then why don't we start there and address the vicarious trauma so it doesn't turn into compassion fatigue, secondary traumatic stress, and then burnout. Mm -hmm. And I got into this work really um, through my work at the trauma center. Mm -hmm. Uh, My colleague and I were asked to start a wellness program for the whole hospital. And um, a huge component of that was teaching anyone that came to listen to us about vicarious trauma. And Mm -hmm. so I've been teaching about this to other healthcare professionals and therapists for a number of years. And I had never really done direct work in terms of supporting people with it until COVID. Mm -hmm. And at that time, so many therapists were just, we were all everyone was experiencing COVID together and everyone was overloaded. And so then I started to figure out how I could start to support therapists specifically with it. And from there it has grown. Right. Right. Yeah. It's, um, you know, some one little story that I've uh, kind of told about myself in in the past uh, years ago, I was in a different career and I worked in the funeral business and the, funeral industry and did all the backroom stuff that funeral homes do. And uh, when you said vicarious trauma, I was reminded of of those those years that I worked in that and that 
<clears throat> I didn't have a name for it at the time, but I remember that there were there were times when you deal with some tragic death or, you know, it might be a child or something like that. And then the, how it affected me emotionally at the time. Um, you know, I think it it's eventually what led me into changing careers and getting into therapy, uh, but becoming yeah. a therapist, I think. Yeah. And what you're describing. So certainly people who work in the funeral industry and around mm -hmm. supporting people through end of life, um, even people like lawyers. I have someone right now that I work with who's an ombudsman and she mm -hmm. I've taught her a lot about vicarious trauma. Mm -hmm. um, but what happens is what you were just describing. We take this stuff home with us. We aren't able to do our you know superpower of compartmentalizing and then we're having trouble sleeping. We can't stop thinking about certain cases. Other sneaky things too, though, like being really irritable. That's one of my red flags mm -hmm. when I'm not taking care of my own VT. Um, mm -hmm. And often my husband has to call me out on it because God forbid, you know, yeah. I acknowledge <laughs> that I need right. help myself. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. Um, and, and like, you know, isolating, withdrawing from people that we love because we just our, feel like we don't have more to give. You know, that's mm -hmm. what happens as helpers and healers, therapists, when we're not taking care of our vicarious trauma. Right, right. So as you, in the work that you've done, what would you say, you, you mentioned being irritable and, you know, I would think that um, the symptoms will be symptoms that we would be familiar with in other folks that have trauma, but are, is there any other, any other symptoms to vicarious trauma that maybe we might not be aware of or might not be on the radar quite as much. Yeah. I mean, and you're totally right in that a lot of this, the signs and stuff that come up for VT are similar to trauma symptoms, depression symptoms, anxiety symptoms. I always like to preface though, that vicarious trauma is not a, a diagnosis. And I'm so grateful that it's not in the DSM-5. Mm -hmm. I hope it's mm -hmm. never put in there because it's not a disorder, right? It's something that happens as a part of our job. Mm -hmm. um, and yet it can be really scary to think about naming it and and addressing it because it looks so much like what is going on with many of our clients. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, a, vicarious trauma looks different for everyone. So when we're thinking about more hidden signs, um, I think a lot of times it's important that people do their own kind of internal sort of um, checklist to see kind of what is off for them. And I have a tool that helps people with that. But, um, you know, other things are like not feeling like you're interested or enjoying things that you usually do. That's like a depression mm -hmm. symptom, right? right? But if you're feeling overloaded, it's hard to experience joy when you feel the weight of all the stress and trauma from your work, right? Mm -hmm. Or just not wanting to go do things like that. Um also specific to therapists is avoiding our work. <laughs> so um, avoiding answering emails or voicemails or, you know, really, really trying to avoid certain people or certain clients. Um, there's nothing wrong with taking a mental health day. And I highly encourage that. But when we start to call in sick more and more, because we just can't make it to work because we're so overloaded. That's a big uh, red flag. For me, something that would happen when I was not doing telehealth, I was in person and dealing with vicarious trauma is I remember I would get to work and I would park and it was like, I couldn't get out of the car and mm. I would sit in the car for five, 10, 15 more minutes, just sort of gearing up to go inside. And, um, that was a big red flag for me when I was struggling to even walk into the building that I worked in. Sure. Sure. Yeah. It's a, you know, there's, it, it's, uh, as, as you were describing all of that, I was, you know, another element that might fall into the category of vicarious trauma. As I was thinking about an intern, I was working with one, one time and, and the, um, they had had they had a client who was has had suicidal ideations and was uh you know you know high, kind of a high risk client and i just remember walking through that with them and just how they were kind of traumatized by you know 
I guess as much as anything, fear of not knowing what to do to help this person. And, um, you know, just would they, you know, just feeling, feeling like they, the, the client was putting such a big burden on, on them. Is that, would, would you say that that kind of falls in that category? I think so. And, and I think something that's common, especially for newer therapists is that, they may try to to work too much. They may try to work, um, overwork themselves because they want to be able to serve the people that they're caring mm-hmm. for. And when we are new therapists, we're so nervous, right? All the imposter syndrome stuff, we feel mm-hmm. ineffective, even if we're doing really great work. Mm-hmm. And so sometimes we'll overwork and not have good boundaries around our time and taking care of ourselves because we feel like we have to, like it's the only way to prove ourselves. And then that is a big risk factor. Right, right. Yeah, and I think it, it's a, it's something that comes with... Um, little bit of experience is being able to kind of create uh, be, being able to compartmentalize um the the thing about it is though is you want to have a boundary between the stuff that's your stuff and the client's stuff and not car- compartmentalize the client stuff within yourself right yeah. exactly yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. so my EMDR consultant actually has a cool little um skill that she uses that she taught me recently and she calls it a somatic stop. Mm. And for anyone who's listening, who's familiar with EMDR, we use a resource called the container. Do you know about the container? I've heard of it. Yes. Uh And so it's this visualization usually that you teach your client to help them um, in a healthy way, contain trauma stuff that's not helping them in that moment. And what my um, consultant does is she actually has little boxes on her desk. And when she's noticing that whatever the content is that she is working with, with a client is really activating her body. She takes one of the boxes and just pretend that these sticky notes are, she'll open it outside of the client's view, but she'll open it just for a second so that she can give herself permission to put that somatic stuff or thought or feeling in there. And then she'll put it back on her desk so that she can be even more present with the client while Mm -hmm. honoring that she's having reactions that she's going to come back to later. Yes. Yes. Yeah. I love that. So speaking of strategies with all of this, and if somebody is noticing that they are, you know, showing, showing the signs of vicarious trauma, what, what's the starting place would you say? I think, The starting place and also the most powerful thing to do is talk to a trusted colleague. Mm -hmm. So, you know, HIPAA and everything aside, as therapists, we sign up for this work because we want to be able to help people, Mm -hmm. but not everyone signs up for that. And for myself as a trauma therapist, even therapists don't sign up to do trauma work. And so I think it's really important to honor everyone's choices and to then also be intentional with who you choose as the people that are going to be supporting you. And so reaching out to a trusted colleague to be able to say like, wow, this, this case was really difficult, or I've really been struggling to take care of myself for whatever reason, um, knowing that they are going to be able to understand that, that they're Mm -hmm. There's going to be some level of shared understanding in the experience so that you're not alone. And being able to talk to other people and having community around us is one of the most healing things for vicarious trauma. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I I would totally agree. I think uh, I'm reminded of uh, a quote. Um, There's a there's a grief a grief therapist that I've followed for years now. Um, His name is Alan Wolfelt, Dr. Alan Wolfelt. And he did a lot of stuff around death and dying and that kind of thing. But he, he talked about um, this, this idea of the quote is grief shared equals grief diminished. And I would say the same for trauma, trauma shared equals trauma diminished. And so, like you said, having a trusted colleague to to process with, to kind of unload, because I think we can carry, we care like it, like you you suggested with the somatic stuff, we do carry it within our bodies, and and it 
comes out in a lot of different ways. Right. Exactly. Like when I'm snapping unnecessarily at my family. (laughs) And so, you know, I I love that quote too. And it's so true. It really does apply to trauma and Mm -hmm. to for survivors and also the people that are helping those survivors. And, and of course there's also things that we can be doing in our days to be addressing vicarious trauma. Um, Honestly, one of the most important things that I work with folks around is being as present as we can in our work with our clients so that their stories and the emotions that we are experiencing with them can have a beginning, middle and end. Mm -hmm. Because just like, you know, the funny thing is in working with vicarious trauma is a lot of it is very similar to working with trauma and PTSD. So with trauma, we try and avoid everything that reminds us of it. It, We don't want to be triggered. We don't want to feel that way. As therapists, we try to do the same thing when we're not addressing our VT, mm-hmm. but being present with those experiences in session with clients, one, it helps us to feel even greater compassion for others, which is really healing. And that fills mm-hmm. our cup back up. It also lets our brain know that there has been a beginning, middle and end of this experience and that it's not happening anymore. Mm -hmm. And so when we can sit with those feelings with our clients, use things like somatic stops appropriately so that we're coming back to be able to look at it later, it's going to let our body move through that process more naturally so it doesn't get all cramped up in there. You're right. Right. Yeah. It's, um, yeah, it's a, I know in the, the work I've done with people that are experiencing trauma, again, it's the, the difficulty for us as therapists is applying the stuff we know to ourself. But I mean, it's a, just, a, you know, the um, one, one of the things that I've been trained in is um, trauma focused CBT. And um, p- part of that process is, is getting people to a place where they can begin to tell the story about what has happened, but it takes kind of building up those, those skills, the kind of the self regulation skills to be able to get there. But I think really one of the things that I, as I tell clients, and I think we're, this would apply to us as well is, um, you know, every time you tell the story about what happened, it changes a little bit and takes on new meaning. And so being able to give ourselves the space to tell the story about what happened in the session and how it affected us, it sounds like would be a a great strategy. Yeah. And there's actually a whole practice around narratives in terms of how we can use that to address vicarious trauma. So we have to think about our, we call them antecedent narratives. So what are the things we're telling ourselves as we're getting ready for the day, as we're preparing for a certain session? Are we saying, oh my gosh, this is going to be so hard and stressful? Or are we saying, I know this is tough work and I know what to do, right? Mm -hmm. So like, what is kind of that narrative that leads up to it? Mm -hmm. There's the things we say to ourselves during the, the stressful experience, during those difficult sessions. Again, is it oh my God, I can't do this. It's too much. Or I have the abilities to sit with this client or whatever Mm -hmm. that kind of, you know, mantra needs to be. And then the narrative afterwards and telling of our story and telling our story, intense experiences deserve to be shared, right? They Mm -hmm. deserve to be acknowledged and sharing it with someone. It again, creates this, it closes the loop so that our brain and body know that that stressor is not happening right now. And that it really internalizes, I do know what to do. I do have the abilities to respond Mm -hmm. to this both internally and externally. Yes. Yes. That's yeah. I think you're exactly right. Well, I know Jenny, that you have created some resources for people just around all of it. Do you want to say some more about that? Yeah, so I I sort of mentioned it earlier. I've created a vicarious trauma tracker that is really, really helpful. It gives people a, a really accessible way to start naming vicarious trauma. 
um, and what it looks like for them. And it's not kind of a one-time use thing. I really encourage people to use it over and over again because vicarious mm -hmm. trauma, it's it's a shape shifter and it'll sneak up on you in different ways at different points in your career. And so the tracker helps you go through a checklist to see how am I doing emotionally and relationally, occupationally. And then it gives you a tracker so you can kind of go through a week and not change anything, but just notice what do all these different things look like for, for me this week. Mm -hmm. And then it prepares you to, to develop a realistic and a sustainable way to address the ways that vicarious trauma is showing up right now. And mm -hmm. so people can find that at, on my website, it, which is braveproviders.com slash VT tracker. So it stands for vicarious trauma tracker, but VT right. tracker. Right, right. And we'll be sure and have those links in the show notes and the show summary. So, well, Jenny, I want to be respectful of your time. And just uh, this has been a great conversation. And I think there's a lot to think about here and just really just around self-care. What So what other thoughts, parting thoughts would you have for folks around this topic? Two main things. So one is all therapists deserve to be cared for too. Mm -hmm. So, so important. And two is I know how hard it is to ask for help. I'm really, really uh, not very good at that either. And yet asking for help is one of the strongest things we can do. And it doesn't mean there's anything deficient in you as a therapist. Mm -hmm. It's hard to walk the walk and we can get stuck in that negative thought cycle of I'm not doing the things I'm telling my clients to do. But once we we are able to break that shell and tell someone, all right, this is the change I'm going to be making. It opens up so many doors for us. Yes, yes. And I would say, you know, to echo what you said a little bit earlier is find those trusted colleagues and the support that you need around being able to talk, talk to folks. I know um, uh, I, I think uh, my clients are surprised when I drop the nugget. Yeah, when I work with my therapist and just go into therapy yourself, is, you know, something that probably the majority of folks don't really do. And I, I know I went years without doing that. And it's been a much better thing for me here lately. And then I would say, too, just, uh, you know, being being a part of like mastermind groups and other, you know, groups um, within therapy circles can be of huge support. Yeah. And I do have um, a community that'll be opening up in the fall specifically awesome. for folks to be able to come and talk about what the, what it's like to be a trauma therapist and to deal with vicarious trauma. It's called the Brave Trauma Therapist Collective. And anyone who goes in and grabs the VT tracker, they'll be able to get lots more information about it. Mm -hmm. But that's exactly what it is, is it's just another option for us to be able to get support around this stuff specifically. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's really helpful when people don't feel like they know kind of which colleague to reach out to, or maybe they're mm -hmm. working in an agency where they don't really feel safe asking for help, or perhaps they're in private practice and the consultation groups that they're in are great but they're so focused on cases that they're not able to process their own experience as yes. being a therapist. Yes. So Jenny, tell folks how they can't, what is the best way for them to get in touch with you if they have more questions? So download the VT tracker. I'm also really active on Instagram at brave providers. And I have a bunch of stuff on TikTok, but that's mm -hmm. a whole new world for me. So you can follow <laughs> me there too. That's also at brave providers. Uh, uh -huh. But those are, those are good places to find me. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. Well, Jenny, it's been great to have you on the podcast. I'm so glad you joined me and hopefully you will be able to do this again soon. Well, again, big thanks to Jenny for being on the podcast. I think this was a really important topic for us to address. And um, I'm so grateful to people that reach out to me with just these kind of these clinical sides of things and, it, and more importantly, just self-care. Because uh, as I said at the beginning, this is what we do as mental health providers or just in this, you know, as caregivers and uh, people in 
in this whole mental health space and in other professions as well. I know there are people that are, you know, uh, chiropractors and also physical therapists, speech therapists and occupational therapists that listen to this podcast. But um, just being able to take care of ourselves and deal with what we get handed by our patients and our clients and knowing what to do with that when it affects us emotionally. So be sure and check the show notes here for Jenny's links and the things that she's doing and um, check it out because I'm real excited about the stuff that she's doing and the work she's doing. And also I'd love for you to learn more about the Practice Launch Club, particularly if you're in those beginning stages of starting a private practice, uh, you can head over to practiceoftherapy.com slash launch club and learn more about that. It's uh, the core group that we've got right now is a great group. And I know in the first um, focus group meetings that we've had, we just had shared a lot of great uh stories and information and really I uh, at least the feedback I'm getting what we're doing is really helping people to know where to focus and also how to grow their practice from uh, the beginning stages so be sure and check it out and also again big thanks to our sponsor of the podcast Therapy Notes and you can find out more about them by going to practiceoftherapy.com slash therapy notes and um Thanks for joining me on this journey and do take time to follow us wherever you might be listening to the podcast, whether it's on Apple Podcasts or Spotify or Google Podcasts or Stitcher or any or even Amazon Music and Audible, any place you listen to your podcast take time to follow us and leave us a review and uh, or give us a rating. That only helps kind of boost and help other folks find us. So take care, folks. Hope you have a good rest of your week or weekend whenever you might be listening to this. You have been listening to the Practice of Therapy podcast with Gordon Brewer, part of the PsychCraft network of podcasts. Please visit us at practiceoftherapy.com for more information, resources, and tools to help you in starting, building, and growing your private practice. And if you haven't done so already, please sign up to receive the free private practice startup guide at practiceoftherapy.com. The information in this podcast is intended to be accurate and authoritative concerning the subject matter covered. It is given with the understanding that neither the hosts, guests, or producers are rendering legal, accounting, or clinical advice. If you need a professional, you should find the right person for that.